forward to hearing Protodeacon Lawrence Cross, who is Senior Lecturer in the Sub-Faculty of Theology at the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. He has been the highly successful organizer of a major congress in Melbourne in January this year on prayer and spirituality. And he is now working on the next Congress, which is to be in 2002. Among other things, he is author of Eastern Christianity, the Byzantine Tradition, of which a new edition has just appeared, and it is available outside. I hope, Archdeacon Lawrence, you will forgive me if I recall in your first edition, mentioning a work by my humble self, you not unjustly described it as an old war horse that's beginning to show its age. <laughs> So when I looked at the new edition of your work, I was very disappointed to find that this description wasn't there anymore. <laughs> as I rather liked the idea of myself as an old war horse. <laughs> but you were kind enough to refer to an updated version. But as the book was written 35 years and more ago, indeed, you need to look at the teeth of your war horses to see how old they're getting. <laughs> so, we shall be listening now to Eastern Christian historical understanding of the Theotokos in text, icon, and liturgy. Proto-Deacon Lawrence. <laughs> Most reverend hierarchs, fathers, deacons in Christ, and brothers and sisters in Christ, you, could, you would agree with me that it would be extremely foolish of me to try and engage in uh, the bishop in those last remarks. I'll just <laughs> leave that. I don't think I really said war horse, but um, we'll check. <laughs> anyway. Um, however... Uh, Bishop Callistos has everything to do with the, with the presentation today. He may not realize that. He had a nightmarish vision of St. Cyril. I had a nightmarish vision, God forgive me, of Bishop Callistos. <laughs> <coughs> In that you will remember last year he regaled us with horrific stories of things that could happen to people um, who dared to use slides. Um, people whose slides jammed but yet continued to give the lecture as if the slides were still showing. Um, uh, 
others who uh, the slides were totally out of order and were describe, attempting to des describe Grecian draperies and in fact in the slide was a large toe. <laughs> and I'm afraid my nerve failed to be in Rome. I was being pursued by uh, Bishop Carlister's predictions and I changed all the slides that I had prepared to overheads. <laughs> so I hoped to, the definition won't be as good but if they had jammed, we it would be a catastrophe. The other thing I have to say too, that this, this um, uh, lecture comes to you courtesy of the Italian police, in that whilst in Rome in the last few months, I was returning from the Orientale Library uh, on my way back to join the family after lunch, and I decided to have a, p a pizza in our local pizza shop where we had got to know the proprietors. I put my bag down against the wall and to my horror at the end of munching my pizza and having my little beer, it was gone. The, uh, I went home, I cried because there were two months worth of research in that, including the paper for this conference. I then spent most of the afternoon with my small son at the Questura for foreigners of the, um, of the Carabinieri, whom my children affectionately call the cats and canaries. The, <laughs> Uh, the Italians have even worse um, descriptions. <laughs> the, um, uh, but to my amazement, it was found at 7 o'clock that night and returned by a very courteous and beautifully dressed policeman. Um, and after signing many forms, I found that the talk was gone, plus many other notes. It had been rifled right through. But thank God, the articles upon which this, was, were, uh, this talk is based were still there. So it's a little bit bitsy, but I hope you won't notice the patches and the joins. So if you'll, re you'll pardon me, I hope if, you, um, uh, if, you, if I repeat one or two things that other speakers have dealt with so well, but I will try to keep my remarks on the early Christian period as brief as possible because uh, Father Taft has already covered that. The, um, however, th there, will, there is one little set of remarks I would like to make on John's Gospel. So anyhow, we'll re try to reduce repetition. But let me tell you in advance what I propose to cover. First, we'll say something uh, about the evidences for devotion and theological meditation upon Mary in the post-apostolic church. And I'll ch try to choose those elements which endure to be incorporated into what I think is the uh, sp quite special and unique Eastern Christian approach to Mary. Obviously, there are common foundations, but there are some that are particular, uh, particularly used by the East. Next, we must have a look at the the certainties and the uncertainties of the early fathers. I would disagree a little with uh, Father Taft, for, but I'm sorry he's not here to disagree back again, but um, uh, about, the, about the fathers. In fact, some of them were a little less sure than maybe we would like to pretend about, uh, about Mary uh, and in the period, say, from Irenaeus to Cyril. And next we must um, account for the impact of the great third ecumenical council in Ephesus in 331. And following that, I want to have a look briefly at four powerful influences whom I believe laid the foundations of the distinctly Eastern approach to Mary, the mother of God. And at that point, we might feed our visual imagination upon a selection of mostly icons of the Annunciation to see how text and art come together uh, to be an expression of tra tradition uh, expressed in the liturgy. We will then stay with the visual and examine the way in which a particular feast entered the liturgical life of the church. In this case, the Feast of the Protection of the Mother of God, or Pokrov, in order to pinpoint more precisely the essence of Eastern, the Eastern Christian approach to Our Lady. And if there's any time left, I would uh, like to say something about the approach to Mary of a cluster of theologians associated with Gregory Palamas. And that group, I believe, rounds out the Eastern teaching on Mary. And if there's time, we might say something about modern Russian sophiologists, but then again, that's a theological quicksand, and if I can avoid it, I will. Um, <coughs> Finally, we might also see how perhaps an Eastern Christian understanding of the Theotokos can be a helpful and healthful thing uh, for modern Western Christians. First, I was trained by...
Protestants largely in the University of Sydney in my biblical studies. Uh, we didn't talk about Mary very much. However, um, the texts have been well dealt with last night, but there is one that I'd like to draw attention to, and that is the, the crucifixion and the giving of the mother of Jesus to the beloved disciple in John's Gospel. And I'm largely using an article by my ex-boss, who has just come to this university as New, New Testament professor, J uh, Francis Maloney. Uh, Francis is not given to exaggeration ever, but he says in his... Uh, his work on John's Gospel in, in Pagina Sacra, he says, as a result of the lifting up of Jesus on the cross, the mother and the disciple become one. The disciple leads the mother, Aista Iria. The situation described in the prologue of the Gospel, when, when the word became Aista Iria, but was not received, has been reversed. He goes on to say, because of the cross and from the moment of the cross, a new family of Jesus has been created. And then this is the point I think that Maloney makes as a, a very balanced and um, sober biblical scholar. He says, despite exaggerated Mari Mariological claims in the past, there can be no avoiding the fact that at the cross and because of the cross, the crucified Jesus has established a new family. And then within the space of three verses, from 25 to 27, the expression mother appears no less than five times. He says, this passage cannot simply mean that the beloved disciple has been charged with the widowhood of the mother of Jesus. Instead, it affirms the maternal role of the mother of Jesus in the new family that Jesus has established at his cross. I think that needs some emphasis because um, the, the, um, the thing I choose to emphasize there is family and particularly mother. Now, enough of, with the Bible. In the post-apostolic church in particular, it's a particularly tricky thing to discuss because of the nature and the state of the sources. For me, the apostolic and post-apostolic worlds always you know, bring to mind lightning storms on a dark Roman night. Um, through the occasional sources, we get something like lightning flashes and we have to be very quick to see what we have seen, um, if, you, if you take my metaphor. Uh, consequently, it's dangerous to generalise because we sometimes don't get the whole landscape in that lightning flash. However, although they are few, I think that there are some very strong evidences for popular devotion to Mary as the mother of God at a strikingly early time. And Father Taft agreed last night, not disputing the, the, um, uh, the period or the timing for the book of James uh, and certainly, um, uh, how can I say... Uh, including the uh, so-called Apocrypha as valuable sources for the life of the early church. In any case, the earliest and sustained comment on Mary and her importance comes, and this is our first slide, Mr. Please, comes in Justin's dialogue with Trypho the Jew. Justin, as you know, a converted philosopher, uh, died around 165, and he is the first person to make a parallel between Eve and Mary. You see it on the wall. He became man, man by means of the virgin, so that by the same means in which disobedience caused by the servants first occurred, by this same way should it also receive its destruction. I choose that passage and emphasize it because the Mary-Eve parallel becomes, for want of a better phrase, a leitmotif that runs all the way through that Eastern Christian approach. It, be it becomes an important ingredient. Now, we note this approach of Justin because this theme reverberates throughout homily and hymn and liturgy and sacred art in all the Eastern churches. Uh, I won't say too much about liturgy because the expert on that spoke last night, but if there's time, we might even sample some texts. My favourite one is from the Ethiopic liturgy, but we'll see. Remember, Eve was the mother of all the living. Mary, then, is, is also the mother of all the living a theme which develops um, throughout Eastern Christian thought to reach its high watermark in the 14th century in the school of Gregory Palamas, or such I believe. 
that's to go too far ahead. Let us simply note the Eve Mary parallel from the second century onwards. There is also evidence that Christians regarded Mary as an intercessor. This fragment of, of a papyrus from the third century provides two pieces of intriguing evidence. It's the first text to use the title Theotokos, God bearer. It's in the vocative. Now, I'm no paleographer, um, and it's very hard to see in such a uh, lousy reproduction, but there is the first um, uh, time that has, has been used. Used in, um, uh, used not in the vocative, is, is its first occurrence, as far as we know, is in the writings of Alexander of Alexandria, but we'll come to that in a minute. This papyrus is fascinating. It's um, in the John Rylands Library, in Manchester, and it, as I said, it contains the first use of the title, Theotokos, God-bearer, and secondly, it's clearly the ancestor of what will become one of the most famous hymns of the Latin church, Subtuum Presidium Confugimus, Sancta Dei Genitrix. Remember, the, we used to sing it at school with great gusto during May, mistakenly in the wrong month, according to Bob Taft. <laughs> anyway, um, <coughs> The text of it uh, follows. This is, in fact, the text of the papyrus. You realise, of course, it is the clear ancestor. Under your mercy we take refuge, O Mother of God, Teotorque. Do not reject our supplications and necessity, but deliver us from danger. You alone, chaste, alone, blessed. So, where have we got to by the end of the apostolic period? Mary is the new Eve, and... Uh, the Christian can go to her for delivery from danger. By the way, uh, the authority on that text says it's no later than 200, so it's late second century. Some would argue, well, that these are pieces of evidence, well, they're like single trees, do they argue for a forest? Well, I think they do. The survival of these evidences do in fact argue for the one-time existence of a forest. Unfortunately, the ravages of history um, and other things have um, sometimes make our attempt to reconstruct that ancient world difficult, but I think those evidences speak for themselves. The, the next piece of evidence from that period, uh, is, which is again much earlier than people imagine, is um, uh, after Justin and the uh, John Ryland's papyrus is the so-called so Protevgelion of the book of, or the book of James. Now, this is an apocryphal work which many of us use as a word to damn something as if it's of no value. And it purports to give us details of the early life of the Virgin. Now, Bob Taft has covered that, so I won't go over the fact that it isn't in necessarily an historical life or a, or a biography. But this text is extremely important for lots of reasons. Um, one is that its, uh, that its critical editor, uh, De Stryker, proved it to be uh, written no later than 200. And what does it tell us? And why is it important? Well, it shows us the developed Marian piety of the age. But most of all, it gives an account of of Mary's presentation and life in the temple in some detail, and as Father Taft explained last night, it, it uh, parallels many elements in the life of Jesus himself. A strong identification of his mother with the divine word incarnate. Now the effects of this upon doctrinal development in the East uh, uh, were far-reaching. Raising the question, uh, of the nature of Mary's holiness and releasing a flood of homiletic literature on these themes. Uh, it had little impact in the West, but uh, you'll see that it starts to come into play in the uh, Western, uh, in the Eastern Church rather, in art, certainly from the fifth century. Now, perversely, um, that was the text. So uh, we might just go back a little bit, uh, and it's just that last one. In the story of the Protevangelion, uh, here I've pulled, pulled, out, pulled out just some little bits. Um, uh, the priest receives Mary in the temple, he kisses her and blesses her uh, with a prayer rather like the, um, uh, that of Elizabeth. Uh, Mary then is in the temple and she's nurtured by a dove. 
uh, and then she's, she's chosen from all the daughters of Israel and given a Davidic ancestry um, and to, to weave the, the uh, purple, the, the scarlet and true purple veil for the temple. That's enough. We might then just whiz forward to one of the masterworks in Byzantine art, very late, I, I know it's late, but um, from the Paleologue period from Constantinople. It's from the Church of, of Our Saviour in the Fields, San Savian Chora. And here is a masterly rendering of it. Um, here is the Annunciation to Anne. Keep going, Mister, fairly quickly, if you would. Here, the birth of, of Our Lady and being washed by the midwife. You'll notice, by the way, that at the door peeking in is a fairly um, a shy Joachim. Uh, uh, it's reminiscent of the icons of a fairly shy Joseph, too, as well. Uh, in, I didn't give you the text, but in the Protovangelion, um, it's almost inferred that Mary is uh, conceived by divine power rather than by human agency. Uh, Joachim, uh, injured by uh, the reproaches of, of his fellow Jews, goes into the wilderness. And while he's in the wilderness for a long, long time, Anne becomes pregnant. The question is, is it not by him? Um, and so, uh, again, the Protovangelion gives, gives rise to the idea of Mary as being God-begotten, which will appear in later Byzantine fathers. Here, um, uh, the little Mary takes her first steps. I love this one because it has a certain tenderness in it. Um, and I also love the drapery over the, over the uh, servant girl. Quite, quite marvellous. But the little Mary takes her first steps towards her mother, Anne. Uh, here, again, are something which has got almost a playful tenderness too. She's a little child. She's a real human being. And she doesn't want to leave her mother. And in a certain way, she almost has to be tricked into going to the temple. And so here are uh, women, virgins, carrying lights. And it's, it's by attracting the little one with the lights that they lead her to her destiny to the temple. Thanks. She follows them. And, here's, and, she, and comes then to the priest. And here is a presentation then, of course, paralleling that of Christ in the temple. Behind her, her parents... Joachim and Anne. Above, and icons often do this, as you know, um, uh, and something else is imposed upon it. And there is the little Mary in the temple being fed by the angel, like, nurtured like a dove, as the text of the Protovangelion says. Here, the priest places his hand upon Mary's head, holding his staff, and blesses her. You, we've already t noticed that text, um, reminiscent of, the, of that blessing of Simeon. And here, the same priest who blessed Mary is holding in his hand the scarlet and purple uh, wool which is given to Mary to weave uh, for the new curtain of the temple, the new curtain for the Holy of Holies. The next slide uh, shows uh, the first, um, I suppose it's the first annunciation in some ways. This time we see Mary at the well. She doesn't, in the Protevangelion, she doesn't actually see the angel in this one. And you can see she's sort of looking up, but not at the angel necessarily. Uh, she hears a voice hailing her at the well. It's only when she goes inside, and it says quite specifically, but I don't have a slide of this, that when she went inside, troubled by this voice, she sat down and she took up the purple silk and began to spin it. And it's then that the angel appears to her. So, why is this important? The reason is that, of course, it overflows into portrayals of the Annunciation, much, much later ones. And you see how the Protovangelion um, uh, becomes very important artistically. And it starts to take on, um, I think, a strong theological meaning as well. Notice in Mary's hand, just here, there, she's holding uh, the purple and the thread runs up into other, other hands. Yeah? Thanks, Mr. I'll give you a whole selection of them now. We'll go fairly quickly. Again, uh, here, by the way, is the... the, the, the in these marvellous... This is a bit off the point, but in, I couldn't resist it. These wonderful gestures of the angel and Mary. It's almost in visual form, how can it be? Thank you. Mary's question, how is this possible? Then this famous uh, icon from Ockrid, there in her hand, again, is the... Is the 
is the uh, true scarlet and, and purple. It, it's there in this black and white, which is uh, just a bit of a ring in here. Really. Uh, this is a, like, a, a mosaic from Constantinople. Again, see, it, it, once more in Mary's hand, the, uh, the, the, red, the red and purple still. And in this black and white, you can see quite clearly here, this time it's a thread. It's an icon, I think, which is on Mount Athos now. I'll just have to check the notes for that, but it's probably not all that important. Um, let me see. Yes, it's... It, um, Uh, uh, a detail, George Mitrofanich from 1621. Okay. And here we come to a Western one in Santa Maria Maggiore. Um, this is late in the 13th century. Um, there is no uh, purple anymore. <laughs> it's in some ways, the, uh, that suggestion from the Protevangelion in, the, in Western art has disappeared. But it is there in an earlier layer in Santa Maria Maggiore. We'll come to that later. Thanks, Nistov. Next one, please. Okay, so the Protevangelion is a point of departure and a difference, I suppose, between East and West. Um, I wouldn't want to make too much of it, but West, Western ho homilists and theologians declined to, declined to use it in the patristic period. They seem to have other kinds of concerns. For example, St. Augustine of Hippo uh, is you know, always very sober. Um, he he is, is, has never invoked Mary. Certainly he praised her fulsomely, but in his work we find no invocation of her. Um, as, as I said, there seem to be different concerns. Um, Mary seems of most interest to people such as Ambrose for her, her, uh, and Jerome for her virginity. Uh, in late medieval times, I the Protevangelion had some influence on the, on the development in the West, but in that early period, it seems to have um, uh, been neglected. However, back, back to the early fathers. Um, despite this, um, Hank, where are we? Oh, we can just leave that one for a tick. <laughs> the, uh, we're a bit ahead of ourselves. The, the, um, the early fathers, however, despite the evidences I've just given you, also were, had to work things out. And, for example, on the question of Mary's holiness, um, uh, some of them had their problems. For example, Irenaeus did think that Mary's was rather um, pushy, perhaps, and, and was uh, showed untimely haste at Cana in Galilee. Uh, Origen uh, was worried. Um, because he seemed to detect doubt at the, origin of, uh, at the oracle of Simeon. Uh, Chrys Chrysostom even spoke of failings in the Virgin Mary, um, and even Cyril uh, spoke of the shipwreck of her faith on Calvary. Um, so that I think it's more to do with their e exegetical approach than anything else. I mean, they f firmly believe in Mary's holiness, um, but what I suppose they're picking up is, uh, and trying to account for is her common human nature, um, she has the same instincts, of course, and, and, um, and feelings as anyone else. So, um, however, it's um, the first person to call Mary Theotokos straight out, as I said before, was Alexander of Alexandria, St. Athanasius' bishop and the first person to lock horns with the heretic Arius. And with Bishop Alexander, the Patriarch of Alexandria, we are in the flow of the great Christological controversies which shook the church from 318, roughly, to 451 and beyond. And to this point, East and West, on the question of Mary, are more or less doing the, uh, um, developing along the same lines, though I think it's fair to say the East is doing most of the theological running. Okay, so... Next, we should have a look at, I suppose, the, the matter that brings the question of Mary in a Christological con uh, context to a head. And, of course, that's the Great Council of Ephesus. Um, we don't need a, a detailed account of Ephesus, but on the board is uh, a, a passage from the famous sermon of Proclus, later Patriarch of Constantinople, um, del delivered in the presence of uh, the Patriarch Nestorius, 
on the 23rd of December in 428. And a quick glance through that, you've had time to look at it certainly, will show you that um, uh, it was almost designed to uh, provoke the reaction that it um, uh, got from the patriarch, uh, whose um, temperament, it would seem, was never the easiest to deal with anyway. Um, Proclus ends with, Behold an exact description of the Holy Theotokos Mary. But we have to underline the point that Ephesus is not to do with Mariolatry. He insists on Theotokos because of its Christological significance. Nestorius and his party also understood that. What was at issue was certainly not uh, greater or lesser devotion to Mary, though indeed greater devotion did uh, and, uh, uh, occur because of the council, but the real issue was the unity of the person of Christ. And so either during or immediately after the council, St. Cyril preached what... Next one, thanks, Minister. What... Um, oh, hang on just a second. The bottom there. At the bottom, uh, Proclus also uses that phrase, if the word had not dwelt in the womb, the flesh would not have sat down upon the holy throne. In that, of course, you can hear the echoes of Athanasius of Alexandria, very much so. Um, thank you. Um, so sometime during or immediately after the council, St. Cyril also preached what Father Claston called the most famous uh, Marian sermon of antiquity. Here's a little bit from it. In it, Mary, he calls Mary Theotokos, venerable jewel of the whole earth, never extinguished lamp, crown of virginity, scepter of orthodoxy, never destroyed sanctuary, vessel of the incompre incomprehensible mother and virgin. And in saying this, he introduces or he highlights perhaps the pivotal idea or the pivotal fact upon which the whole Marian approach of the East rests. He called her scepter of orthodoxy, which means that Cyril and his council declared that one of the essential criteria for a true conception of Christ is the place given to Mary in that Christology. There is to be uh, no theological quib quibbling here. Um, as Elizabeth Briere has pointed out, and Bishop Callister said this just the other day, this is literally a matter of life and death because it's a matter of salvation. Because being a Christological question, it goes beyond theory and it touches the whole question of salvation. And as St. Gregory the Theologian and Athanasius, I pointed his uh, uh, text out before, he, the text influenced by him before, have said, um, any aspect of humanity that is not assumed by God incarnate has not been healed by him. And so, uh, again, to, to uh, quote Proclus, if the word had not dwelt in a womb, the flesh would not have sat down upon the holy throne. So the Feast of the Annunciation, because it celebrates the Virgin's divine motherhood, is also the Feast of Christ's humanity, the Feast of the Incarnation. And this insight has entered deeply within Eastern Christianity and is particularly evident in the liturgical text for the Annunciation, the Feast of that divine humanity. On that day, the Church sings, uh, For in you the whole fullness of Godhead has come to dwell bodily. Because of this, there is nothing proper to human life in which God has not participated. Therefore, mankind is saved in Christ's fullness. Wonderful stuff. So Ephesus and Cyril... Um, uh, uh, ...protect and express the divine saving actions that have come to pass through Mary. As St. Cyril says, through her the Holy Trinity is adored on earth, the heavens and angels are gladdened, demons chased, uh, that is chased away, the devil cast down from heaven, <laughs> fallen man restored, and all creation comes to know the truth. But only in virtue of her motherhood. Again, that uh, uh, an element in Father Taft's talk, it's because of her motherhood, not a personal attribute, but her motherhood. Cyril says, through you, the only begotten Son of God has shone forth as light. The real cause of all is Christ. 
yet she was indeed the instrument through which they, uh, this happened. And so this is another essential element in the Eastern Christian view uh, which will reach its apogee in the Palamite school. Now, um, I just selected three icons just for fun because I think in some ways they express the common tradition of East and West in the, in the post Ephesine period. This rather lovely one, Mary is surrounded by guards or a retinue precisely because in some ways, and I suppose it's a little bit, I'm agreeing it ra rather with Grabar here, because uh, like the Queen Mother, she, uh, she holds her royal son upon her lap and she's given in art a, uh, a retinue, emphasising divinity and, and royalty. This is late, of course, this is late medieval, but nevertheless it's a revival of both, of both the, the old um, uh, lost uh, Ro uh, Roman mosaic uh, techniques, but it also is a, a recapitulation of patristic theology from in the 13th century. Um, uh, the uh, enthronement of the Virgin Mary in heaven from Santa Maria in Trastevere. And this, again, one which is most famous t f uh, for us is, um, Mr. Proust, is um, uh, from Santa Maria Maggiore, the end of the, th end of the 13th century, or almost the 14th. Okay, that's just something to look at, really. However, one of the, uh, uh, in the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, uh, there's something which is much, much... Uh, oops, hang on. Uh, no, we go back. Just one more, if you were. I think I put that in the wrong order. Used that already. Ah, here we are. Thank you. Uh, on the triumphal arch, however, in Santa Maria Maggiore, we find this, which is, in fact, um, uh, done in the 5th century, immediately after the Council of Ephesus, commissioned by Pope Sixtus III. Um, uh, above, in this, in this register, um, the Annunciation, the spirit of a dove coming down upon Mary. Notice, by the way, this is in, influenced by the Protovangelion. In her hands, the, scarlet, the true scarlet and purple for the weaving of the temple. Um, below, the Adoration of the Magi. Again, Mary, uh, uh, clothed as, uh, as queen, sits on the right hand of, of, the, of the divine Logos, uh, who has a star to indicate uh, in his uh, cross in his uh, halo, rather, seated upon a royal throne, and on this side, a, a rather mysterious woman, again in a in um, a purple. Um, some authors think that that phrase from Saint Leo that uh, Father Taft quoted last night, you know, all that Christ was is gone into the sacraments of the church, um, it, uh, gives us reason to think that this uh, figure here is. Um, uh, the Ecclesia ex gentibus, the church out of the Gentiles. Some people think it's a figure of divine wisdom. Um, in some ways, I really do think that later on we might say that the Virgin and um, uh, the church are one. It's, it's, however, uh, we, uh, Mary and wisdom. The, uh, so these show, show us, uh, in the, in the immediately after Ephesus, uh, Ephesus the, um, uh, the, the royal dignity that the council upheld of Mary, uh, her, her uh, intimate relation to her son and also the influence of the Protevangelion here in the, uh, as a source. So, um, that'll do. Next one, please, Nestor, if you would. I'm conscious of time. We have lots to fit in. Now, what, the foundations laid by those early fathers... Um, uh, and by the council, uh, I think are built upon, in the first instance, by uh, these figures. St. So Ephraim the Syrian, but when you actually look at his dates, you'll, f you'll see, of course, he's um, uh, maybe the person who influenced everybody else, but that's something we can argue about later. Ja Jacob of Saruj and St. Romanos and the Akathist hymn. So this 5th century and into the 6th is a very fertile time for uh, uh, thought on the question of Our Lady. The essential elements of the Christian approach to Mary then step off from Ephesus, but they are amplified by this cluster of writers, such as to, to contribute powerfully to what I would call then a developing Marian culture. And as ever in the East, it's expressed liturgically. The, um, even though it was Prosper of Aquitaine who made up that um, phrase, um, uh, Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi, it seems to be best honored in the East. 
Um, there are four major sources then in this patristic cluster, and in chronological order, they are as follows. We might have a look at the first fun. They're non Greeks. Um, maybe there are no Greeks there at all, because we don't really know who wrote the Akathistos. Uh, the other three are Assyrians. The, um, we should, however, note that the most influential of these writers, both for style and theology, um, uh, e Ephraim, may in fact be the um, source of many other things, but um, his, his nickname, of course, is the Liar of the Spirit. And he's... Um, Anyhow, I've said that already. What is clear is that he's the most influential, influential liturgical poet of all on Syriac and Byzantine hymnography. And sure enough, he's, he gives great prominence to Justin Martyr's Eve Mary parallel, um, which has been drawn some 200 years previously by the, again, uh, Assyrian philosopher Justin. And it fills his work. Um, Ephraim, you can look, uh, savor those texts as, as I speak. Ephraim abounds in that parallel and in that contrast. Behold the world, he says, two eyes are placed in it. Eve was the blind left eye. The right shining eye is Mary. And basically, I suppose it's a contrast of death and life. Mary, Eve gave birth to Cain the murderer, Mary to the life giver. Uh, but Eve, mother of all the living, became the source of death to all living. But Mary, the new branch, took growth from Eve, the old vine, and Christ, the new life, dwelt in her. So I suppose um, this um, uh, belief of, of uh, Ephraim's contains more than a hint of Mary's saving role. Um, and I suppose one of the most important elements for our purposes, for our, our theme in trying to find the Eastern Christian approach, is that Mary is very much identified with the church in St. Ephraim. He actually uses uh, what might, might sound like a, a very, very modern phrase. He actually calls her the symbol of the church. It occurs actually in his hymn on the crucifixion. Um, the, he calls her symbol of the church and in the uh, Diatessaron, he declared of Christ that, quote, he freed his church from circumcision and replaced Joshua son of Nun by John, who was a virgin, to whom he entrusted Mary, his church, as Moses entrusted his flock to Joshua. So you see, for Ephraim, without invoking technical or abstract language, the holiness of Jesus and that of his mother are, are, are not at all at the same level as other saints or angels. They wouldn't agree with Bob Taft, I don't think. In the Nisibine hymns, he writes, You alone and your mother are in all things fair, for there is no flaw in thee and no stain in thy mother. Of these two fair ones, to whom are my children similar? And he says also, And I am a spouse, for you are chaste. I am handmaid and daughter of blood and water. Yes, she's purchased by Christ's blood, certainly. For you have purchased and baptized me the son of the heavenly one who came and took up his abode in me and I became his mother. Now I know we have to be careful. The holiness of Christ is that of God himself and Mary is a creature. And Ephraim, Ephraim speaks of her uh, as, uh, as, as that, as one baptized uh, uh, in the blood of, uh, of Christ. But nevertheless she is the first saved and without resorting to um, uh, uh, theories of immaculate conception, he sees her as the first of the elect, whose election is part of the mystery of salvation, that the, of the salvation of all that which has been won by her son. So, it's a funny concept to invoke here, but I would, I think we should modify the view we heard last night with a kind of primacy, at least, given to Mary. The second Syrian to enrich our approach to Mary is Jacob of Saruj, known as the flute of the Holy Spirit. His ode on the, on the, on the Blessed Virgin condenses the very best insights of, Eastern, of the Eastern Church to this point. And it's a work of very deep devotion and spiritual passion. That's the wonderful thing about these texts. They're very passionate and poetic. Like Ephraim before him, he uses the Eve Mary parallel to the fullest. Just a tiny touch. The child who stretched out her hand to her prostrate ancestress and raised her up, the daughter who wove a garment of glory and gave it to her father, Adam, 
so that he might cover himself with it after he had been denuded under the trees. And you know, for example, in our triad, how that theme of Adam outside the garden, naked, alienated, reverberates all through the liturgy. And again, he says, along with his um, uh, countryman Ephraim, how could I paint the picture of this marvellous, beautiful one with ordinary colours? Too exalted and too glorious is the image of her beauty. Well, Jacob, however, is interesting for us for another reason, because he also allows us to pinpoint one of the... Well, it's a real difference, whether it's a serious difference between East and West. Um, in that he stresses Mary's perfect purity, and he would affirm that there remained in her daily the unblemished nature um, of a human being with a will directed towards the good. Uh, and he also affirms the virginity of her body and the sanctity of her soul. And he says she was wise and filled with the love of God. But he doesn't resort to, uh, say, a, a theory of immaculate conception. Um, and he has, like the other Eastern fathers, he, he has a different idea of what original sin is. For the East, the most important thing about original sin is mortality, uh, death. For the Western fathers, it's different. And so Jacob, because he doesn't, because of his um, uh, a different approach to uh, man's Aboriginal predicament, believes that that um, Mary, um, through her own merit, reached a certain step of perfection. It sounds a bit Pelagian, doesn't it? But it's you know, he said God examined her how far she was above and free from all evil. No movement towards bad desires arose in her, nor any thought exciting sensual pleasure. The love of the world did not burn in her. She did not occupy herself with puerilities. And then he says, at the Annunciation, something different happened. Then she was freed from original sin. And he says explicitly that Mary was purified like John the Baptist, or John the Evangelist, or Elijah, or Melchizedek. And it seems that he assumed a kind of twofold purity in Mary, one which was reached by nature and the other uh, merited, as it were, by the former um, given to her at the Annunciation as the final preparation for her divine motherhood. So, um, I seem to have lost a page there, but make things shorter, won't it? The next source we might turn to is the Akathist. Now, we've recited it devoutly the other evening, so I don't have to say all that much about it. But it also is a, um, a, a document influenced by apocryphal sources. For example, there's a, some influence of the apocryphal Matthew in it. Uh, remember when we were talking about um, the idols falling down uh, in when Mary and the Holy Family went to Egypt, fleeing from Herod, and the... the um, uh, that, that, again, that story comes from an apocryphal source. Um, let's see. The Akathist very much emphasizes the, the, that the powers uh, which belong to Mary, which uh, was strictly belong to God. Uh, but because Mary is Theotokos, mother of the Creator, um, she, in a sense, dispenses those. Um, let me see. I, the other thing I suppose we may should say at this point too is we should be careful of language. Um, and Father Taft again touched on this too. In that uh, these are poetic compositions and, and, and they're a genre in themselves. And so those heretis me, those greetings, you know, hail and, and, and the, uh, are to be taken, uh, as in some ways are deliberately superlative. However, I, I wouldn't dis, um, say that they weren't a, se uh, a source for theology. They both certainly are. Um, uh, but certainly not of a technical kind of theology. There, no, there, might not, not, there is not much um, material there for a geometry of the divine, if you know what I mean, but there is certainly for um, uh, a, a more um, heartfelt kind of theology. So, as far as we can tell, this was, the hymn was composed for the Feast of the Annunciation, and it continued 
Um, even after the uh, con uh, composition of Kontaki was abandoned in the 8th century, and it's been of a huge influence in the East, and it also, had, by the way, has influenced the West as well, and it's been one of the principal vehicles for the transmission of many of these um, Eastern ideas to the West. As far as we can tell, it wasn't um, composed for the siege of 626, we think it is. Rather, it probably had a, a preface added, which gives that impression. Um, and some of the things, the most impressive things that come from it uh, are that Mary is the reconciliation of many sinners. She's called the stole of those stripped of the right to appeal. The one who's paid the ransom for transgression, the gate of salvation, who has begotten anew those who were born in sin. Um, the samples are on the board. Um, what more can we say? Except perhaps a light note at this point. You remember, of course, that all the uh, uh, constantly throughout the hymn, we have the uh, phrase, O bride, uh, yet a maiden. Uh, um, yes, yeah. The, um, uh, one of my, a very cultured Greek friend of mine years ago in Australia told me a story. He was from Alexandria, and he told me a story of a, of a, of a devout priest who was trying to put the Akathist into um, English. And he imagined that somehow or other you could do the same trick with a prefix from Greek. You could say, a bride, um, uh, yet uh, not a bride, but by just using a, a prefix as you can do in Greek. Nymphi anymphite. So um, he, they managed to just catch it before it went to press, because Father, who spoke very good English, had made a little mistake. He missed the nuance that you couldn't say, a bride unbridled. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, on a, on a light note, we should turn to, um, to uh, Romanos. Um, Romanos is the third Syrian, and Rom called the Melod, the hymn writer, the, the, um, the musician. Um, Mary, for, he, for him, is not only the very human mother of Jesus, the strongest thing in his um, uh, hymnography is that she is the mighty intercessor for all humanity. And here he strikes a note which um, we've seen in the earliest text, but amplifies it powerfully. She has shown man the right way, according to Romanus, and at the last judgment he prays as follows. Through the prayers of the ever-virgin Theotokos, spare me. In the beautiful poem on the Nativity, Mary herself affirms her universal motherhood. I've put some of it up, uh, on the overhead. She says to her son, I am not simply your mother, but for all men I beseech you. You have made me the mouth and the glory of my whole race. In me, your world has a mighty protectress, a wall and a support. The exiles from the paradise of delights look to me. Again, uh, another um, uh, 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 quotation from Romanos, which includes some of that. Cease lamentations. I shall become your advocate with my son. Put away sadness, because I have brought joy into the world. For it is to overcome the realm of sorrow that I have come full of grace. Lovely, isn't it? And then to the Magi, um, on behalf of the Magi, to Christ, she, she go, uh, again speaks that text which we've already seen. Those um, fathers consolidate the tradition. And you can see the theme is building. Um, perhaps we might just um, then turn to see how this manifests itself in, a particular uh, in the genesis of a particular feast. Um, here is the f an icon you're probably all familiar with, the Feast of Our Lady's Protection, which um, illustrates an event which may or may not have happened um, in Constantinople in a century we cannot pinpoint. Um, <laughs> the, um, nevertheless, the literary source for this feast of the veil or the protection of the mother of God is the 1st of October. And it, it, at the source of it is the Greek life of St. Andrew the Fool. And it was, all, it was translated into Slavonic and is extremely popular with the Slavs. And um, it seemed to have slipped into oblivion amongst the Greeks until recently. Be because although the story is about the saving of Constantinople, uh, um, there are only as far as I know, um, Slav examples of, of, of this icon. And they really took it to themselves and made the 1st of October its feast. It's now in the Greek uh, Synaxarion, but later on October 28th. Now, um, anyway, the, 
let's see. Further on this question of the Feast of the Pokrov, the story of Andrew the Fool's vision, um, let me see, tells how the, the mother of God with her veil prays for the city of Constantinople and it occurs in the chapel at Blakerne where her veil and her, her girdle had been preserved from the time of the Emperor Leo the, the I in the 5th century. Now the person, um, let me see, the person that, that Andrew the Fool is talking to here, there's Andrew. Andrew is a, is a kind of a Constantinopolitan, Constantinopolitan holy bag person. Um, the, um, he lived on the streets, they said he drank wa his water from puddles and, and um, he lived rough. But yet somehow or other, some, somehow or other he had this noble patron, Epiphanius, who stands alongside him here. And Andrew is point, almost touching the cloud upon which Mary seems to stand, um, pointing out to his disciple Epiphanius this vision. Epiphanius also is said to have seen it. I'll read you the story uh, straight out. When a night-long doxology was held in the Holy Soros at Blakerne, the blessed Andreas was there behaving in his usual way. Golly. Epiphanius was also there, and with him one of his servants. At the fourth hour of the night, the blessed Andreas, who used to stand as long as his zeal gave him strength, sometimes until midnight, sometimes until morning, saw the most holy mother of God appearing visibly, very tall from the royal doors. You can take us through some, nest. there's a few here. Um, maybe this goes slowly. She was escorted by an awe-inspiring retinue, um, uh, amongst which there were, amongst others, the honourable forerunner and the son of thunder, holding her by the hand on both sides. Many other holy men in white garments accompanied her. As she approached the ambo, the blessed man um, went up to Epiphanius and said, Do you see the lady and mistress of the world? And he answered, Yes, I do, my spiritual father. Before their eyes, she knelt and she prayed for a long while, besprinkling with tears her godlike and immaculate face. Having finished her prayer, she went into the sanctuary and prayed there for the people standing about. As she prayed, she removed with beautiful dignity the veil that she had on her immaculate head, appearing like a flash of lightning, and spread it. It was large and awe-inspiring, with her immaculate hands over all the people that were standing there. For a long time, the admirable men saw it stretched out over the congregation, radiating the glory of God like a lectrum. As long as the Most Holy Mother of God was there, the veil was also visible. But when she had... When uh, but when she had withdrawn, they could no longer see it. Now, don't, now, no doubt she had taken it away with her, but her favour she left to those who were there. So the Feast of the Pokrov was apparently first introduced amongst the Slavs by Andrei Bogolyubsky in Vladimir in the second half of the 12th century. At least so Ryden says, he's the uh, authority on the life of um, uh, Andrew. And the reason why St. Romanos appears in so many of the icons is simply that the 1st of October, the date of the Russian feast of the Pokrov, is also the feast of St. Romanos. He's, in other words, he wasn't there when this vision occurred. And, and as, as in his own icon, St. Romanos is often depicted as singing from the ambo of a church, the Kentakian of the Nativity, his first Kentakian, which was also revealed to him miraculously by the Mother of God. And so that fits very well with the Pokrov, and so he's included in it. Um, uh, there's also a brief account of the icon, if you're interested further, in uh, Uspensky and Losky's famous book on the meaning of icons. Um, but what we want to say, I suppose, is that, that um, in this icon, in some ways, a whole lot of um, uh, themes come together. We should ask ourselves, well, what is this veil that she spreads over the people of God to protect them? Um, we've seen <laughs> the red wool and the red skein before, the veil of the temple. It, but it's, so it's, it's both veil of the temple, but it's her veil. And when we put ourselves back, of course, into the ancient world to say, well, uh, who wears a veil? The answer is a married woman wears a veil. In the, in the Roman world, to take the veil meant to be married, not to become a nun. Um, so when Mary takes off her veil, it's the veil of her as a married woman, the veil of her motherhood, and it's with her motherhood that she protects her people. The, uh, so in, a, in the, the plastic arts, if you like, express um, that basic theological uh, foundation of Eastern Christian approach to Mary, that uh, she's our protectress, protectress because she is God's mother. 
Um, so as bride of Christ and mother of God, she represents the whole body of the living church. And it was her determination, I suppose, to, to accept the action of the Holy Spirit within her body and to hear Christ, uh, that, that which was in, interpreted symbolically by the, fathers of, uh, uh, by the fathers as each Christian's reception of the Holy Spirit in baptism. There we return to that theme from last night. Certainly we're, we're asked to emulate her behaviour, but I believe that the Feast of the Pokrov shows that her role is um, indeed uh, at a level of primacy above yours and mine. I don't know what other word to use. Can I give you a modern example of how this um, appears, for example, in the, in the preaching of the modern Orthodox Church or the comparatively modern Orthodox Church? 100 years ago, approximately, in 18, uh, 1884, Archbishop Dmitry Muratov um, uh, preached a sermon in Russia uh, entitled Rejoice Our Joy. And he said that, of Mary that she is the joy of the whole world. And by the way, of course, it's, a, it's for the feast of the, of the Pokrov, for Our Lady's protection. She, he says she is mother, mother, or again, underline it, by grace of rebirth. She is their protection, that is Christians. She is the protection of Christians and the guardian of all Christians from evil by the glory, power and might granted her. And he then says that all Christians need to seek spiritual joy, which alone can truly and effectively comfort us in any sorrow. The one source of pure and holy joy in the Lord is the all-holy and life-giving spirit, the comforter. But then he says, but first of all, one must take care to win and preserve in oneself the grace of the whole, all Holy Spirit of God and be united in one spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the giver of this pure and holy joy, wait for it, this, the giver of this pure and holy joy in the Lord is the most holy mother of God. This is radical and it would annoy some Christians um, um, from other traditions. But it's on the line. She, as the life-receiving and life-bearing source, is the first receiver, capital R, of the grace proceeding from God's throne and the first giver of this grace to all believers who pray and ask. I don't like words from the Latin language that end in R-I-X particularly. Um, uh, great on my ears, but it's very close to... Um, um, to being a, a, a theology of a, media, a mediatrix of grace. 100 years later, Patriarch Pimen, the late Patriarch of Moscow, on the 14th of October, which of course any right person knows is really the 1st of October, um, the... <laughs> we're all calendars in Melbourne. <laughs> yes. Uh, preached, this, preached this to the Academy um, uh, of, the, of the Moscow Theological School, uh, on the Feast of Prokhorov. He says to his uh, intending clergy, your life should be built wholly by you in the light of that marvellous fact, that wonderful reality, which is being witnessed today by the church, that upon entering the house of God and conducting divine service, you are entering into a prayerful, living, close and real communion with the Mother of God, that beside you stands the Virgin Mary, quote, above heaven and pure purer than the sun's light. That's Cyril. Before the throne of God, she is the spiritual mother of all those for whom the pastor is the spiritual father. And he finishes, looking at the face of the most holy mother of God, learn from her how to love the people of God actively and vitally, observing and entering into the lives of your future flocks. There it washes up on the, on the shore of, of modern preaching. I believe the source of that is Palamite, um, and to do with perhaps with the Palamite revival, but uh, Vladika, we might have run out of time, or they all might, all might be exhausted, but um, we might just come to the end of those Pokrov icons, uh, Nestor, if you would. On the table over there is a related mystery. Oh, so that's, this is important. This is one of the earliest ones, and it's quite different. It's from the gates of the, it's from the, gates of the holy doors of the Cathedral of Suzdal. Um, it, it's also a Pokrov icon. You might just drop it down a bit, Nestor, if you'd be so kind, would you? See, now, Our, La the, 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 Our Lady's veil is held here by angels, as it is in the rather more elaborate hieratic um, 
beautifully constructed icons. And above here, I'm sorry it's such a lousy reproduction, but above here is Christ with his hand in blessing. See? So, in other words, Mary, Mary's veil, her motherhood protects the church, but it is Christ's power, Christ's blessing, which is given to the church through her. Um, and the icons on the table, which you might like to look at on the way out, are three icons, all Russian, of the feast of the, uh, uh, sorry, of, the, uh, of Our Lady's title, Joy of All Sufferers. In this one, if it happens, uh, you see her standing alone. She's not holding a baby. Uh, but her son is above her uh, in every one of them. And uh, it's, the icons represent the prayers of the faithful going to Christ through her and grace being uh, received from Christ through her. Um, I believe these two feasts you know, very much speak to one another. Um, and both of them are immensely popular in our Russian tradition. Now, um, there might be some time to say something about uh, Palamas, but maybe i just say one little thing about Western... Um, but the situation perhaps today and, and, and in the modern West, something use, maybe it might be useful. I was brought up a Roman Catholic in Sydney, uh, um, Australia, um, uh, in a, what I suppose was almost an, an Irish parish. I'm deeply grateful for it, but I'm afraid it was a period in which, in, which in some ways, the devotion of the, of the Roman Catholic Church had hit a kind of bathos. Um, so the hymns that we sang to Our Lady were things like bring flowers of the rarest, bring flowers of the fairest, and O oh Mary, we crown thee with blossoms today, Queen of the Angels and Queen of the May, and it was content free. <laughs> the, um, now, I don't, it's, it's, it's wrong to, to, to compare the worst of something with the best of something else. I know that's disastrous ecumenically, and Father Taft warned us about that last night. But <clears throat> the, in some ways, the... Uh, after the Reformation, and, and in the, maybe it's a wash-up of pietism, um, in some ways the, a peculiar kind of insipidity uh, uh, crept into Marian devotion in the West. Uh, let's see. The, let me put it this way. Uh, in the hymns to Mary, what characterised ma many of them in the West was a, a world dark and evil, society is hostile, and the devotee to Mary is somebody steeped in sin, you know. Um, the, we stand before thy son, his loving heart upbraids us, the evil we have done. But if thou wilt appease him, speak for us but one word, for thus thou can obtain us the pardon of the Lord. Well, it's sort of Germanus of Constantinople, you know, in some ways. It, um, it's a bit forbidding. And when it's not that, it sometimes tends to the sentimental um, uh, stuff that I just quoted. Now, the Vatican Council opened the door, I think, as I agree with Taft from last night, for the recovery of, of an image of the Madonna which doesn't maim. But such a Mariology is rather cons has rather conspicuously failed to materialise. A lot of post-conciliar preaching and writing about Mary is, is, has, has become rather self-defeating in a way. There's a wonderful opportunity, but I wonder whether it's been taken up. Because most recent, the most recent treatment of Mary has been you know, rather horatory and moralistic. Um, in, <laughs> Mary is, is presented to us as a good example, as a model of obedience to God, somebody, somebody we should imitate. And I would agree with Eamon Duffy, the um, uh, his, uh, Cambridge historian, uh, that any Mariology which is focused primarily on this aspect of Mary's role is doomed from the start. Um, it's far too cerebral and abstract. And so wh whatever the faults maybe of the old medieval and uh, Reformation Mariologies and their excesses were, they certainly weren't dry. But I think a lot of the the um, uh, modern stuff is ra rather dry. How can the East help? Well, I think this uh, restatement of, uh, of Mary's motherhood is very important. You see, the Marian tradition for both churches is rooted in something much more basic, something much more concrete, the simple fact of her childbearing, her motherhood. And this, of course, isn't to suggest that her childbearing was a brutal um, uh, physical fact, divorced from her free cooperation with the will of God for all mankind? No, certainly not. Christi Christianity can never separate human childbearing from human loving. And we can't separate Mary's womb from her heart and her will. Um, but the 
the church after Vatican II has in fact been curiously coy about the material fact of Mary's motherhood. Uh, in, in the past, however, the church has not been coy like that. An example uh, is, um, let me see, Fra Angelico, for example, the ceremony of car carols, the lit litany of Loreto in the West all remind us that the figure of Mary is, is complex, rich and contradictory, and too rich, too compl uh, complex and contradictory to be simplified and moralized into banality. And the Eastern Church affirms that. So a Madonna who is primarily an example is as oppressive and dispiriting and as life-denying as any of the projected Madonnas of the past. For example, in, in uh, Julian of Norwich's revelations, our Lord did not invite us to contemplate Mary in order to see in her what we must do. Rather, we are invited to see in her how we are loved. And so Christians have never thought of Mary primarily as a good example. Rather, she has been loved as the principal miracle of God's grace and power. And because she is the cause of our joy, she is the cause of our joy. That's her primacy. We must learn again then not to imitate but to celebrate the multiple glories of the Theotokos, the Ark of the Covenant within which the glory of God came to rest, the Rose of Sharon upon which the dew of the Godhead descended, the Gate of Heaven through which the light of life shone on mankind, Christians love the mother of God not because she sets a standard that they must imitate, but because beyond all desiring and deserving, she was the mother of God. That'll do. As, um, Thank you very much, Father, for bringing before us some of the riches of the Christian tradition concerning the Mother of God. Um, thank you also for so many uh, illustrations. One of the pleasures of coming to America from the continent of Europe is that we have the possibility to see all the latest technology and I'm particularly filled with admiration about the magnificent modern arrangements for, <laughs> that we have in the centre here. I think we must start introducing such things in Oxford. <laughs> now, uh, do we have a little time for question and answer? 4.35. 4.35. Would people like a brief question and answer session? Okay, uh, perhaps we'll distribute cards, two minutes. Please comment on your palimatic section you did not deliver. What can we learn from the 13th and 14th centuries? What we find, I think, from the 13th and 14th centuries is the, you know, the high watermark of all those developments we're talking about. Here we are. Um, the three... Uh, I won't we won't use overheads for this, but the three people I, I had picked out to discuss were St. Gregory Palamas, Nicholas Cabasilis, and Theophanes of Nicaea, uh, all of whom live in the 14th century. And now, um, the... Let me see. I, I suppose... Um, so some people might say that they make the, the strongest claims for, for Mary... Uh, an example would be as follows, as follows from Cabasilus. For example, um, the Mary is seen as um, uh, not merely an instrument in uh, the hands of God, but someone who uh, exercises her will and cooperates with God's purpose such that she is synagogue with God, um, a co-worker. And... Uh, this is seen, uh, uh, her assent and uh, the, gi the giving of her consent is, is um, uh, seen as, you know, very p as an integral part of salvation itself. Um, so 
Cabasilis even goes so far as to say, and wait for it, I, I found this quite startling when I first uh, read it, that in the time between the um, resurrection and, uh, sorry, the ascension and Pentecost, Mary was in fact the uh, giver of the spirit in the church pre-Pentecost. Um, the other thing too, I suppose, I want to say about them is that it's in these writers that many of the statements that they make about Mary, you can take as either ecclesiological statements or Mariological statements. They um, are almost the same thing. So, <clears throat> obviously they, re they, um, they emphasize Mary's surpassing holiness. Um, for example, in Cabasilas, he says, there was no saint before the Blessed One was. First and alone, an own, an, sorry, first and alone, truly free from sin, she showed herself holy. The saint of saints. And whatever may be said more, she opened the door of holiness to others, being excellently prepared to receive the Saviour, etc. So that's the kind of thing that you'll, you'll find there. Saint of saints, uh, a surpassing holiness, um, uh, someone who even bestows the spirit upon the church in the, in the pre, uh, post-ascension, pre-Pentecost time. Um, Theophanes of Nicaea is even stronger, who would place Mary's mediation in the very order of things universal. He says, it cannot happen, why, this is very strong, it cannot happen that anyone of angels or of men may come otherwise in any manner whatsoever to participation in the divine gifts flowing from what has been divinely assumed from the Son of God, save through his mother. So there's a kind of sacramental role um, uh, uh, assigned to Mary as a kind of second bishop in the hierarchies under Christ, who was the first bishop. And so in, in, in her um, divine motherhood, as, say, Theophanes of Nicaea understands it, um, uh, let me see... Uh, and he gives her almost divine titles. Um, sorry, I've lost my spot there. Um, um, so because of her divine motherhood, then she almost uh, uh, receives divine titles uh, or, or names are given to her. That's enough to say. With, with um, uh, St. Gregory Palamas, who's best known to us, I suppose, because of the Balamite controversy, he tells us things like this. He says... Um, on the question of Our Lady's mediation, it's, it's not open to any doubt or question as far as Palamas is concerned. It's implicit in his theory of destiny, her place in creation. And there he's like Theophanes of Nicaea, in that it's almost par uh, it's part of, the, of things universal. He says, no divine gifts can reach either angels of men save through her mediation. As one cannot enjoy the light of a lamp, save through the medium of this lamp, so every movement towards God, every impulse towards good coming from him is unrealizable, save through the mediation of the Virgin. She doesn't cease then to spread benefits on all creatures, not only on men, but even on, upon the celestial incorporeal ranks in heaven. So that's why you see in the, um, I suppose they... Uh, uh, Oh, no. uh, we place her higher than the cherubim and, and more glorious beyond compared than the seraphim. So, um, she in a way, she receives gifts of knowledge precociously and the mutual love between her and her son was perfect. So she's the first to see the risen Jesus and is herself bodily assumed uh, with a slight delay into heaven after death. So that's sort of the, a, a quick um, taste of the Palamite school and I think you uh, uh, what I was trying to say was that that kind of view overflows and is expressed um, uh, in, in the Feast of Pokrov and you find it in modern preaching as well. I gave you two samples of that, one from the end of the 19th century and one from Patriarch Pimen. Yes, here's uh, another question, well first a comment the Holy Synod of the Melkite Church has also instituted the Feast of the Protection of the Mother of God on the 1st of October. And indeed it is kept on that date in the Greek monasteries on Mount Athos. But it's true that the printed Minea do not have any feast for the protecting veil, so they use 
texts which are in a special leaflet printed in the last century, and where those texts come from, I don't know. The practice of having the Feast of the Protecting Veil on the 28th of October dates only from after the Second World War. 28th of October was the day when Greece said no to um, Mussolini when he wished to advance through Greece with his troops. And um, the Greeks then expelled the Italians from northern Greece and they felt they had the special protection of the Mother of God as they defended their land. So that's a very modern celebration, the 28th. But here's the question, could the veil be the cloud of the Old Testament? I don't know. Uh, but yes, in a sense, Shekinah, I suppose. Um, uh, in that... Um, God becomes incarnate because of Mary um, and she is the, the one whose womb contains the incarnate word. She is in that sense almost the, the personification of Shekinah. So I suppose the, I don't know, but there'd be a good case for it. The other thing I wanted to say too, just touching on things Italian, uh, Vladika, and that was that um, there's, also a, there's also a story from uh, medieval history uh, from Italy uh, reminiscent of the uh, protecting vow of the Mother of God from Sienese history. Um, uh, at a particular crisis when the Florentines were warring against Siena, which was a particularly devout city, um, the people of Siena also believed that their city was covered by uh, a protective veil of the Virgin in a, in a vision, which they saw on the morning um, when the, uh, uh, the sun rose, uh, revealing the Florentine army's encampment. So, and they believed that they were delivered by Our Lady and her protective veil. So it actually occurs in the West as well. Just a slight one. Mm. Given the importance of the crucifixion account, why do we not have a major prayer, Our Mother? We invoke her as Theotokos in the East, we invoke her as Our Lady, Holy Queen in the West. Why not Our Mother? I think the short answer is that to Christian ears, I think that would sound like parody. A, par a parody of the, of, um, of the Our Father. The, um, uh, while I have been, I suppose, emphasizing that um, pri uh, uh, primal role given to Our Lady in our salvation, Our, our Lady is not the equal of God, and, and um, uh, it's not into the Virgin Mary that we are baptized, we're baptized into Christ. And being baptized into Christ, we cry, Abba, Father. It would be totally dissonant to, um, to pray a, a kind of a, uh, a prayer, our mother, sort of, if, 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 for example, by that question, one means something like a, uh, along the lines of the paternoster, it would be, I think, repugnant. And, and um, uh, uh, there's enough crackpot stuff about goddesses circulating at the moment in uh, New Age circles to... Mm. The popular Marian devotion that seems so easy to criticize appears very similar to the early examples that regard Mary as the refuge to whom poor sinners flee. Is it possible that the people know something about Mary that the scholars miss? <laughs> yes, always, yes. Uh, I think that's always the case. Um, I suppose also one of the things that people often say, of course, is in many of the or many of the apparitions of Our Lady, say in the in the West, Medjugorje, Lourdes, uh, um, Guadalupe, etc., uh, she often comes as unaccompanied by her child. But it's, uh, I suppose, a silly criticism in another way, and um, uh, in that that um, uh, her child is now well and truly grown, and um, uh, the. Um, uh, yeah, I suppose the people of God do know something that the scholars don't know. Um, I'm not saying that... that uh, yeah, start again. 
Sorry, I'm a bit tired now. Uh, the the Subtuum Presidium, you know, we fly to your patrons, O Holy Mother of God, stands, is one of the first notes in Marian devotion sounded in the early church. It's still true for us now. Uh, what I was saying about the um, uh, modern devotion was, a, um, uh, or more recent modern devotion, was something which was unduly pessimistic. I mean, uh, uh, remember, Our Lady is our joy, um, our hope, um, and uh, the kind of... Um, uh, pietistic thing that was being discussed largely, I took that from Eamon Duffy, um, was something which was positively harmful, but it would never be harmful to, to, um, to accept Mary as our mother. So yes, the faithful do know something that uh, the scholars don't know. But I don't, I, the scholars weren't trying to say that, though, in, in this particular case. Is that enough? Even if the faithful do know something that the scholars don't know, the scholars know quite a lot, and some of it is very helpful. And perhaps there need not be a conflict between what the scholars say and what the faithful know and express. Cannot they be reconciled together? Thank you very much. Oh, my mystical sufferer, oh,